In today's lecture, we're talking about mycobacterium, the genus where we find the organism responsible for tuberculosis. The genus Mycobacterium are slow-growing, non-motile rods. Um, in fact, some of them are so slow-growing that it can take weeks to grow. Uh, both the tuberculosis complex, but more notably the Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis complex. Most species have generation times that are greater than 12 hours, so very, very slow when you compare that to our typical E. coli with a doubling time of only 20 minutes. The structure of the mycobacterium cell wall is such that they have a gram-positive-like peptidoglycan layer, although they don't stain using Gram's procedure. Uh, the reason for this is that there is the presence of mycolic acid, which is a lipid, um, in the cell wall structure, um, and it presents a really important permeability barrier. It repels dyes that would otherwise be able to stain the organism. The presence of this mycolic acid allows us to stain mycobacterium using a technique called acid fast. And what acid fast refers to is uh, the retention of stain following decolorization with acid alcohol. I've put a link above to a video where you can see the procedure for performing the acid fast stain. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is really important historically, not just for the diseases it causes, but for its association and really its discovery uh, by Robert Koch of Koch's postulates fame in 1882. These bacteria can be very challenging to work with, so I've already said many of them are slow growing, and some species actually can't be grown at all, so Mycobacterium lepromerium has never been cultivated. Some bacteria within this genus, like Mycobacterium avium, Lepromerium, Leprae, and Ulcerans, are biocontainment level 2, while the Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex um, are all biocontainment level 3. In this image on the right, you can see some acid-fast bacilli, so these bright pink little rods uh, across a blue background. The Mycobacterium are host-associated, although they can survive for short periods of time in the environment. The Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex organisms are found in the respiratory tract. This is true for M. bovis and M. tuberculosis, feces, milk, and urine, which is the case primarily for M. bovis. Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis is one that we find in the feces of ruminants. Atypical mycobacteria, so non tuberculous species, are oftentimes environmental organisms and will readily survive outside of a host. There's 196 species of mycobacterium, and they're grouped in a number of different ways. So we have our mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, which includes tuberculosis, bovis, africanum, microti, caprae, and pinnipedi, and then our non-tuberculous mycobacterium, so kind of everything else. We can group them by the speed at which they grow. So we have slow growers and rapid growers. And then our non-mycobacterium tuberculosis complex can be described based on pigment production. So we have photochromogens, which produce pigment on light exposure, scotochromogens, which produce pigment without light exposure, and non-photochromogens, which produce pigment without light exposure after they've had exposure to light. Mycobacterium bovis is the cause of bovine tuberculosis in both cattle and wild ungulates. And in people, it causes a TB-like disease. Tuberculosis, of course, is caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis, or MAP for short, is a cause of Yoni's disease in cattle and also other ruminants. Mycobacterium lepromerium causes feline leprosy, while Mycobacterium leprae causes leprosy in people. Our Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex organisms are associated with granulomatous disease. We can also refer to them as mammalian tubercle bacilli for the pathological lesions they produce, and these are very important zoonotic organisms. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is really primarily a human disease. This one is less commonly encountered in animals. Um, and it's estimated that up to one-third of the global population is latently infected. So it's very, very common uh, among people. Up to 10% of these infections could reactivate, become active TB, resulting in clinical disease, and all of the morbidity and mortality associated with that. 
In 2016, there were 10.4 million new cases of active tuberculosis and 1.7 million deaths. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is notorious for its synergism with HIV. Uh, tuberculosis is one of the leading causes of death among people with AIDS, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Zoonotic infections can also occur with other uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex organisms. Embovis used to be a very common cause of tuberculosis in people in Canada. Fortunately, we've nearly eradicated it. In cattle, disease associated with Mycobacterium bovis takes two forms. Um, oftentimes, we actually don't see any outward signs at all, and this would be most likely the case in Canada. Um, we've eradicated it from our domestic herd, and so any animals that had M. bovis would be detected so early that we wouldn't have sort of the obvious classical pathological lesions that we typically associate with M. bovis infections. In those animals who do have lesions, so the two classical forms, we can have generalized disease where cattle are emaciated, lethargic, weak, and anorexic, or respiratory disease where they have a chronic, intermittent, moist cough. Mycobacterium bovis infections are associated with destructive lesions characterized by these granulomatous, caseating, necrotic foci. And I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like in a few slides. Transmission of M. bovis between cattle can occur through a number of different routes. We can have direct nose-to-nose -nose contact, and that can either be between cows or cattle and infected wildlife, or ingestion of contaminated feed or water. Um, this is a disease that has a really long incubation period, including a period of latency. So it can be quite difficult to detect early infections, which makes control of the disease very, very difficult in endemic regions. The way that we think of this organism spreading between cattle is we have one animal with active TB. It's coughing, it's got this moist cough, expectorating out droplets. Um, one of those droplets can make its way into another cow, into the lungs. Within the lungs, there's two things that can happen. Our little M. bovis can disseminate to other body sites, so lymph nodes or other organs, or it can form granulomas. At this stage, we can either have clearance of the infection, so the body can deal with the organism, kill it, and be done with it. We can get formation of a stable granuloma, so the animal becomes latently infected, or we can have progression to active tuberculosis in that newly infected cow. Now, it's important to know that we can get reactivation of those stable granulomas, so it can break down and the animal can become clinically ill. These are some images from a paper describing uh, bovine TB in Nigeria. And when looking at these images and also the next couple of slides, I just want to put out this caution that this is really advanced disease. This is far more um, severe lesions than we would expect to see in Canada, where Mycobacterium bovis has been essentially eradicated from our domestic herd, and cases are only very rarely identified, and typically they're identified at an early stage. So we would most likely never see lungs that look this bad. But what you can see in these classical lesions are all of these granulomatous lesions over the lungs. Here we have a micrograph where you can see acid-fast bacilli, so these nice bright pink uh, organisms within these granulomas. And I think this table on the right is a really useful summary of where we tend to find the organisms. So the lesions are most commonly seen in the lung and lymph nodes. And then on the right, you can see the differences in test positivity, either by acid fast staining or PCR. Here we have a few more lesions. So on the left, we have chronic pyogranulomatous pneumonia, these very, very large, very abnormal caseating lesions. On the right, uh, we have a lymph node. Um, this one here is actually cut in half, so you can see the cut section of all of these granulomas with caseous necrosis and calcification. In this image here, you can see another uh, cut section of a lymph node, so chronic granulomatous lymphadenitis and granulomatous pneumonia with caseation. So these cavitating destructive lesions are, are really a hallmark of particularly advanced uh, mycobacterial infections.
in this picture here, what you can see is an acid fast stain of a uh, cytological smear from a sheep plong. Um, this is a very old slide. We found it in an archival collection. Um, and this particular one dated from 1968, predating the widespread elimination of tuberculosis and ruminants in Canada. And what I just want to draw your attention to here are these acid fast bacilli, these nice bright pink structures. In this slightly dated map from the OIE, or the World Organization for Animal Health, you can see the distribution of bovine tuberculosis uh, globally, at least where it was recognized back in 2018. Of note, uh, at that point, there were several cases in Alberta, Canada, while the rest of the country remained uh, tuberculosis-free in our domestic herd. So we work really hard, and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency works really hard to keep our domestic herd uh, MBOVIS free. And so the question is, what happens if there's a suspect case? Well, the first thing that the CFIA would do is quarantine that farm and implement movement restrictions. So no new cattle are allowed on, and no potentially exposed infected animals are allowed off. They would conduct a detailed investigation, so getting information about the history of the farm and their veterinary records. They would perform the tuberculin skin test and potentially also the interferon gamma blood test. Any animals which were positive would then be humanely euthanized and necropsies would be performed. And if there were positive animals in the herd, um, the entire herd would be depopulated. Following depopulation, there are extensive requirements for cleaning and disinfection of the premise to ensure that the organism has been eliminated from the environment. And then finally, there is compensation for the producer. So the CFIA will pay the fair market value of the animals which had to be destroyed. There's two different key tests which are used. Um, one is the intradermal tuberculin skin test. This one is very, very sensitive, but slightly less specific. So the idea behind this test is to use it as a screening test. We should be able to identify all positive animals using the intradermal skin test, but we may have a few false positives. It's slightly less specific. The premise of this test is it identifies the delayed type hypersensitivity reaction, a type 4 hypersensitivity, on injection of antigen into the animal's skin. The interferon gamma blood test is less sensitive, so we can have false negatives, but it's very, very specific. And so it's a really useful secondary test to do on those animals which test positive using the intradermal skin test. It allows us to identify false positives. Blood is collected from animals which test positive using the tuberculin test, and the white blood cells are exposed um, to mycobacterium antigen, we then measure the production of cytokines as a response to that exposure, which provides a highly specific indication for diagnosis. In the last few years, we've had a number of infected herds in Canada with Mycobacterium bovis in 2016, 2018, and again in 2023. I've put a link above to a brief video series from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which describes how they responded to these outbreaks. So where is all of this Mycobacterium bovis coming from in Canada? If our domestic herd has been, uh, if it's been eradicated from the domestic herd, where is it coming from? We do have two wildlife populations which are known reservoirs of this organism. One are wood bison living in northern Alberta and in the Northwest Territories, primarily around Wood Buffalo National Park. And the second are elk in Riding Mountain National Park in Manitoba. In other parts of the world, wildlife reservoirs are also recognized. Um, European badgers in the UK and Ireland, the bushtail possum in New Zealand, and wild boar in Spain. This is a, an image of a post-mortem examination of a wild boar from Spain. And what you can see is granulomatous and necrotizing lymphadenitis. So abscess lymph nodes with this sort of dry caseous material, um, these highly destructive lesions. Mm -hmm.